My name is Fred Bivens, uh, and I'm here to show you what to do um, to salvage a bowl. There's, there's few things that are more frustrating than um, turning a bowl green and letting it dry for a couple of years and coming back and seeing that you got a crack down the top inch, inch and a half of the bowl, which you know is going to turn a $300 salad bowl into a $100 salad bowl when you cut it down. So, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, I found this article. Uh, it was by um, one of the turners in a Hawaiian wood turning group. And it was on uh, the use of the piwa. And piwa is apparently a Hawaiian term for um, the tail of Ralph's kissing fish. If you look at the shape of that, that they, they call it a piwa. But over the years, um, other people in woodworking have called them Dutchmen or butterflies a variety of things, and, and I can show you here one bowl that I have, have repaired. It had a very slight crack, but still that crack made it less than saleable. And uh, people are never sure, even if you, you glue it up, they're never sure if that crack is going to continue. Well, you and I both uh, have come to accept the fact that a crack will go so far and then, especially if you glue it, it's not going to go uh, any farther. But it's nice to have a mechanical uh, device to make it, if not safer or more secure, at least so it looks safer or more secure. So I read this article about making and using the Piwa and I have, um, I don't have the original article, but I do have just one copy here of stuff off um, the Hawaiian um, uh, wood turners website. And they, they uh, sent me to a Stebbins Studio, stebbinsstudios.com, and you can look at this later. And it explains the whole, the whole process. But what you need to do is first you have to start by making your piwas or your, your bow ties. Now, I have um, a box full of them. If you start out and you make some, you might as well make a bunch of them in a, a bunch of different woods so that you can contrast whatever you're using. And this is how, and I'll pass some of these, if you guys wanna pass them around, um, I cut them on a table saw, and if you set up for uh, you know an hour or two, you can cut a whole bunch of them. You cut across the grain so that when you make them into the size you need, you have the straight grain running the length of the bow tie. The next step, you have to make some type of a template so that you can route out the hole that this goes into. Now the way you do it is you take a piece of plexiglass or Lexan or whatever you happen to have. Um, it could be even thin plywood if you wanted. And you glue one of these with hot melt glue. The only use I've ever found for hot melt glue in my wood shop <laughs> is this. Um, and it's, it really works well because of the failing of hot melt glue, and that is that it'll come off. So you glue your, your bow tie to a piece of Plexi or Lexan. And then, now some people use a large router, but this is a laminate trimmer. And you can buy for your laminate trimmer um, a bushing set, just a little uh, a special little adapter that goes on and then different size bushings. So you start with the, with the bushing, the small bushing, and what you do is you actually cut around that bow tie that you've glued onto your plexi. And what you end up with, when you make that final cut, 
is everything falls out of the center and what you've got is the outside shape that you want to cut. Fred, what size router are you using? I'm using a 1 8th. Um, I use, uh, and other people have, who have done this recommend an upcut spiral bit, but I find that as a waste of money because every time I use one, I break one. So I use a straight, um, a single flute straight bit. Uh, some companies call them a veining bit, but it's a 1 8 inch bit. Um, I find, I think I bought the last one and I, I still have it here and I can pass this around. Um, I would like it back though. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're the case. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I bought it out at Woodcraft. I, I used to buy the other ones about, uh, well, every time I did a new dovetail, I would buy a new bit. So I bought them in packages at uh, Home Depot or Menards or wherever. And I've since not had to do that. So, um, so you have your pattern, and now you have to take a look at your crack. Now, I'm, I brought this piece, it's got a couple of big cracks in it, and I, for those of you that know, um, I sort of learned my lesson on what you can and can't turn this, uh, this spring when I had a chunk come out of a bowl and it went through my face mask, so lest you ask, I was wearing a face mask, it went through the face mask and I took 15 stitches. I thought I lost my eye, but I didn't. It, um, and it healed up pretty well. But this has a pretty significant crack in it. But I'm gonna show you just how to repair um, the part of it that, uh, that I would turn. I wouldn't turn something with this significant of a gap in it. Do you normally put these in at this stage? I would put it in, this one I didn't return obviously, because I don't want to put it on a lathe. And I, I actually I went through my bowls and I had to find one that was cracked, so, so this was it. But normally what I do is I turn the outside of the bowl, which is the way I turn them when I, when I turn them after they've dried. I turn the outside of the bowl, well, I turn the, I turn the oval out of it first and then I chuck it back up. And then I turn the outside and that's when I'll do that on the outside. Doing the inside of a bowl is much trickier because depending on the size of the bowl, you have to be able to get your, your laminate trimmer in there to cut that. And that takes a pretty big bowl to get on the inside to do it. And uh, so it's a, it's a lot more difficult to do it. But you can do it by hand. You can do it with a chisel if you wish. But I would ordinarily have turned this and possibly even have sanded it because I might not see the crack until I've sanded it. So what I do, and you'll see in my shop, um, being as I'm a person of a certain age, I have a lot of these around, these pill bottles. Um, and this one happens to be filled with the sanding dust from the inside of a cherry bowl. And I'll, I'll collect that when I sand. You know how you get that? It always lays in the bottom of the bowl and that stuff that doesn't go up your dust collector. So I scrape it out and I put it in a jar for later use. Then I'll fill the, um, the crack if there's a significant hole in it because people don't want to see a very open crack, but if you fill it, and you fill it with a matching wood. I use just a palette knife and I use the medium CA glue and I make a little paste of that. But you have to work quick because, and depending on the brand, you know, the last stuff we sold here, and I can't remember, it was a different brand, um, you had about a third of a second. <laughs> which, um, I'm not quite that fast. So this stuff works, works a little quicker, or a little slower than that. So you've got 10, 12 seconds. So I use, um, 
just cardstock, you know, you get all these mailers that come to the house that are thick cardstock and they're nice and shiny. Um, mix up your paste. Just mix up what you need. You put a uh, couple dabs of glue on there, mix a little bit of the sawdust in there and grab it quick and then you put it into the crack. So you've filled the crack. And then you can sand that off if you want it to be even. It depends on how, uh, after you do this a couple times, you'll, you'll figure out what you need to do to, to make it work the best for you. But you can just sand that off so you've got a nice smooth surface. And then you can also see if you have to add more of this paste to the equation. So you, you get it to where you want it to be. And then you have to apply your pattern, your template, to the piece. And you have to decide, I try to catch the very end, if I can, catch the end of the crack so that it looks like it'll, it'll go no further. And so all you do, see if I, get this in the right area. Well, it doesn't really matter. So, um, you need to squirt out a, a significant amount of hot glue on all four sides. Come on. You might, if you're going to do a lot of this, invest in a better glue gun. And you put it on and you have to let it cool because it doesn't work if it's still warm. So you put it on, you let it cool. And then obviously you put on your safety gear. You might, um, depending on what you're doing, I, I usually wear a face mask on, on the lathe anyway. And I should have brought my new one to show you. I, after my accident, I went to a firefighter's mask, which is Lexan. Um, Where'd you get that? eBay. Yeah, Jeff got one and Ron Campbell got one. And, um, my accident sent some ripples around. Uh, <laughs> Boy, I don't know. What did we pay for those? Um, yeah, is it? I think with the with the respirator and stuff, it was about 170 by the time I was done. But I always wear a respirator. I have a lung disease, so I always wear a respirator under my face mask anyway. So this comes all as one piece. So. Now I'm gonna try and do this. I might end up needing um, a hand here, but yeah, thanks. Not everybody's gonna be able to see this um, in person, but, huh? I said these aren't very good. Okay, so if I, if I hit your arm, don't scream. Now the bushing just sets the distance in from the shape you've got cut. Uh, and you'll notice, if you looked at those pieces that I passed around, that when you cut those on a table saw, you end up with a sharp point on the end. When you get done cutting this hole, you have round corners. And I'll talk about that in just a minute, but I'm gonna cut the hole here. Before I start, what I like to do is start in the center and then work my way out. Because um, if you try to get close to the edge, you might end up with a bushing on top of that and then you've just screwed up your whole deal and you gotta start over, so.
When you work it back and forth, make sure you've got the whole thing cleaned out. Yeah, I think I got it, Jeff. Yeah. Well, okay, so you've got two options at this point. Well, first you have to, there, the value of hot glue is shown right there. It does not hold, which makes it perfect for this. So. You can peel it off or scrape it off the outside. Or you can turn it off. So now you've got a hole that has rounded corners. And you have two options. One, sandpaper. You take your, the piece that you're going to inlay. <clears throat> and sand the corners. Just round the corners. Until you can get it to fit. Now, I drove that in, but what you would do ordinarily, and I'm not going to glue it here, but ordinarily you would um, just fill that with CA glue and use your little spritz bottle with the um, accelerator in it and get it to bond. But now, if, if you're not happy, like this one, um, I see I bumped it a little bit on one side, and I'll pass this around. Um, if, if you're not happy with the fit, you go back to your palette knife and paste, and then you fill in those little, the little cracks as best, best you can, and nobody will be any the wiser. Now you can do that like I did on this bowl. You do it until you get it the way you want it. You can see here, there's actually four of these, and I'll put that so you can see it. There's four of those in there, but they overlap. This camera? See, there's four that overlap, and you can still see the crack on the top. Now hold it there, and that's why I put the one on the top. So that ends at the end of, of that crack. Where did you, where, where did you put it in, in regards to how the, the line of the crack is going? Well, I, I see, I'm not sure if this is just the demo, but it shows the center, the end, the bottom of the crack. I try to do the ends, both ends of the crack, and I try to do, depending on how long the crack is, I might do two, three, four, five, six, all the way up. I had a bowl, the, the bowl that Ralph showed where he undercut on the side, I did a bowl like that and I, I was so very pleased with it because it had a flat lip on it and I undercut it and I did just a perfect job except for one little, little bump out in there. And I went back in and I broke that sucker right in half. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I put so much work into that bowl, I'm going to fix it. And so I probably put 20 of these. I redid the whole thing all the way around. 
And then I, I returned, and it, it just became a matter of principle to me <laughs> to, to do that. And uh, so I put it all back together, and I, I glued it up, I put it all back together, and I finished it, and I called it my bad mojo bowl, because all the bad mojo was in that bowl. And, um, and I sold it. The guy came and looked at it, and he said, this is fabulous, you know? So, <laughs> So I took a, a, what was going to be trash, and I turned it into a treasure. P-E-W-A. And if you look it up, um, you're going to have to look it up and mention that it's Hawaiian. Uh, so the other thing, if you didn't want to round, just one second, if you didn't want to round the edges, a small chisel you can cut the square corners, or the, they're not square, you can cut the sharp corners with a small chisel. And if you've got this piece chucked up on your lathe, um, it's, it's quite stable, and it's quite easy to do. And, you know, just a, a few taps, and you've got the corners cut. Use a sharp, a very sharp, small chisel. Um, so, you had a question? I've never had a problem with that. What I do is I usually let them stand proud. I'll take one that's thicker. Um, and this one I had the, the bit extended and I just didn't change that on here. Um, but I've got these cut to different thicknesses. And I've got many more here if I wanted it thicker. I usually let it stand proud and then I, I'll sand it off or I'll turn it off and then sand it so that it has the same shape, outside shape of the, of the bowl when I'm done, unless I have significant wood left to take off the bowl. But I've never had one where I could feel it after I was done finishing it or after it sat around for a while. I've never had one feel like it had pushed out. How old is your big salad bowl? How what? The big salad bowl that you've got, how old is that? How long have those been? Those have been in, well, let's see, when I turned that. Um, 2009, so that's six years. And you, you don't, I mean, we can, you don't have to pass this around, but you can feel, I mean, you can feel just a little bit of the, of the edge there if. What if you made a larger part? That's up to you. I, I wait until my wood is really pretty stable before I turn it. Um, I'll have, uh, I'll, I'll let it dry for usually a couple of years, especially on a larger bowl. I've had bowls that I've turned um, that I let dry for six or seven years. And so if you get down to, if you can get down to 8% moisture content, which is kind of hard to do, um, you know, the chances are pretty good that, that it's going to be pretty stable. 10%. Sometimes I, after I get them down for a while, I'll turn them. I'll, it's hard to say rough turn them when you're finished turning, but I'll do the first cut on the outside and get it in shape. And then um, I'll turn, turn it around. I'll turn the inside, take the, take the, ovalness out of it and then I'll let it set for a couple of days before I turn again to see if it's going to adjust because of the difference in, in size. So that might help also because then you're giving it a chance to equalize with the humidity and temperature that you're working in at the time and you've taken off that extra wood. So I, I just haven't had a problem with them. Um, and I guess whether they actually do anything for the crack or not, uh, you can do very thin ones, and I've done that on some bowls, very thin ones, um, just so that you get the impression that you've, you've fixed it. But I've never had one crack further once I've done it. Um, back to this website. Um, so you don't wanna go through the problem of making your own template you don't want to, you don't have access to or you don't have a table saw, 
So you, you cut this, and this, incidentally, you're cutting all with one setting on the table saw. Once you set that blade, and it doesn't matter where you set it, it's what you decide you want it to be. You run it through one way, you run it through the other way, you flip it over, you run it through, you run it through, and you're done. You've got, and you can do that all day long if you want to make as many of these as you want. So it's simple enough to do. But if you don't want to do that, um, this Stebbins Studios, which again is stebbinsstudios.com, offers a precision inlay repair system for sale. And you can buy, and they laser cut everything, so you're gonna get, get things um, pretty precise. The uh, laser inlay repair system, or the precision inlay repair system, uh, consists of templates and patches, which are sold separately. And um, you can select your size, and they go even further because they have hearts, and they have dolphins, and they have tortoises that you can put in. <laughs> so I couldn't figure out how to cut a tortoise on my table saw. So, um, <laughs> but you know that, that ring turning method that um, was demonstrated last week or last month, um, and I, I don't remember who did that. Uh, yeah, the ring turning. And I had seen that years ago. That's, a, that's an old method that I think they use in Switzerland to make Christmas ornaments. They turn the shape and then just chop them off. But you could do that. But then you'd have to make the, the inlay template as well. Anything else? All right, thank you. If you've only seen our videos, then you've only seen the smallest fraction of what the Geek Group is. It's a place where you can craft, improve on, manufacture, repair, rediscover, test, discuss, research, and share just about any project in a one-of-a-kind massive facility with tools and equipment you might otherwise never get the chance to touch, let alone use for your own projects. The Geek Group is a learning institution. We're people with different skills, backgrounds, and perspectives, figuring out how to make ideas a reality and sharing those insights with everyone. To help you along the way and to get help from you are tens of thousands of members from around the world connected to the lab in real time through internet relay chat and live streaming video. A single-minded appetite for knowledge and a drive to create are traits common to all geeks. We found a way to amplify those traits, a way to give you the resources you need to improve lives. Get involved at thegeekgroup.org. We thank the Future Girl Foundation for the grant that made these videos possible. GIMS! And the thousands upon thousands of purchases and private donations from members and viewers like you that keep this place running. Thank you.